Hi everyone, AI labs depend on the cloud for scalable GPU power. But this comes with inherent security vulnerabilities, because the cloud is essentially just someone else's computer. Every time a company places their multi-million dollar AI model in the cloud, they're running the risk of someone making off with the model weights. So why do these companies take such a gamble with their most valuable assets? Keep watching to learn more. This video has three parts, cloud computing, attacks on cloud systems, and keeping AI data secure. Part one, cloud computing. As part of the research for this video, I actually met and spoke with Jason Clinton, who's the CISO at Anthropic. And of course, he knows a lot about cloud computing and model training. Unfortunately, he only has one quote in this video and it's right near the end, but keep an eye out for it. This video is also a follow-on to a previous video I made talking about whether AI labs would lose their model weights to espionage. So you can check that out if you haven't already. Let's talk about cloud computing. Cloud computing is very convenient. Instead of buying a bunch of servers yourself, installing them, providing the power and the internet and everything, you can just go to a website and rent somebody else's computers. Cloud computing lets you scale up really quickly, much faster than you could actually obtain hardware for yourself. And it lets you scale back down again when you have reduced demand. Cloud providers will provide resiliency, redundancy, backups, and geographically distributed data centers. It's more expensive in an absolute sense than having your own systems because the cloud provider has to make a profit after all. But most startups and companies still use the cloud because of these many advantages. In fact, I found a stat that 94% of large companies worldwide use the cloud in some way. Although that might be a misleading statistic because most websites are hosted on virtual machines in the cloud, for example. So I would say probably at least 94% of large companies have a website. Even other entities use cloud computing as well, from individuals to academic institutions to even governments. The US government actually uses cloud computing for classified projects. From 2019, there was a $10 billion over 10 years contract between the Department of Defense and Microsoft. So for a while, Microsoft was the only company providing secure cloud computing to people that had classified projects. But there was some controversy and it was canceled in 2021 in favor of now a $9 billion deal spread across four different cloud providers from Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Oracle. Everything I've said so far just applies to general purpose cloud computing. But things are a bit different when you start talking about AI. When you're training or deploying AI models, you do need compute, but mostly you need GPU compute. Interestingly, data center GPUs are really, really expensive because of NVIDIA's product segmentation. NVIDIA charges not very much for their consumer GPUs because it's mostly gamers in the past buying them, and they charge a lot for their data center GPUs. That's why so many machine learning enthusiasts startups and researchers actually build their own machine learning training systems because they can buy the cheaper consumer GPUs. There's a fascinating article by Tim Detmers called Which GPUs to Get for Deep Learning, which I'll link in the description below. At the time of that article, the 4090 was the fastest consumer GPU and the H100 was the fastest data center GPU. And the upshot is that the 4090 has two to three X worse performance than an H100, but the 4090 is between 4x and 5x better performance per dollar. So if you absolutely need the fastest speed, then you have to get data center GPUs. Or if you're a big company that's running data centers, you can't get away with buying the consumer GPUs and putting them in a data center. So in that case, you also have to buy the data center GPUs. But if a 4090 can actually get the job done, then you should fill your systems with those instead. Like I said, a lot of startups do this as well. As long as you're not actually running a data center, you're probably okay with the consumer GPUs. At scale, however, the capital investment required to buy all these GPUs use and the computers and get it all set up is absolutely insane. And you need different expertise to actually run all these systems. So these are other reasons why the cloud looks really appealing to companies that need GPU compute, especially when the demand actually fits the cloud computing model. For example, really high spikes of demand when you're running training runs, and then that demand disappears when the researchers are going and thinking about something else. I hear that Anthropic and OpenAI both make heavy use of cloud computing. Some other companies like Microsoft and Google also make use of cloud computing, but they're actually cloud providers. So of course they just use their own stuff. The other benefit of the cloud from a company's perspective is that there's a whole ecosystem around it. For example, if you start to worry about security, 
Well, there are companies that specialize in just analyzing the security of your cloud deployments. Actually, most security issues in the cloud just boil down to configuration errors because you can configure your cloud to do whatever you want, but not every configuration is actually going to be safe and secure. So like I said, there are whole companies that specialize in just checking the cloud configuration to see if there's any security vulnerabilities. Because after all, you really have to trust the cloud if you're going to put your AI model weights there and do training or inference. Part two, attacks on cloud systems. As I said before, the basic problem is that the cloud is just somebody else's computer, which means you get increased security risk from that vendor or from other third parties that they also use, especially because many cloud providers co-locate lots of virtual machines on one physical machine. And these virtual machines can come from different customers. So if there are security vulnerabilities, then potentially you can have a different customer affecting your own workload. They kind of have to do this because many requests to cloud providers are for very small amounts of resources. So they can't afford to give a full physical machine to every request. That's why they slice it up into smaller virtual machines. But anyway, here are some potential attacks. Someone who has a virtual machine running on the same physical machine can potentially hack into your virtual machine. My favorite example of this is a paper called Hello from the Other Side. They were able to use a side channel to send information from one virtual machine to the other using a little known feature of the CPU. But the side channel was such high bandwidth that they were able to stream the video by Adele singing Hello from the Other Side hence the name, AKA the YouTube side channel. Another type of attack is someone who controls your software supply chain can replace code with hacked versions. And there have been many high profile incidents of this, including the solar winds case recently. Worst of all, someone who has physical access to the computer running your workloads, running your virtual machine, can actually eavesdrop on the memory or the system bus inside the computer. For example, they can install a special PCIe device that sits right beside the GPU and just uses DMA to read physical memory. Every PCIe device is allowed to do that. There's even a fascinating attack from this year called Rambo, which looks at electromagnetic transmissions from RAM and can actually deduce what's inside that RAM from several feet away. So even if the machine is air gapped, you can still potentially steal all the information from its RAM. So what can you do about these types of attacks? Well, first of all, don't co-locate virtual machines. Don't get a system where there are multiple virtual machines and you don't own all of those virtual machines. Just rent separate physical machines, which is what any larger company would be doing. Or even using an entirely different data center, which is what government contractors would be doing. You can make sure that the computers are using a hardware attestation mechanism, which makes it harder to install illegitimate or unauthorized code on those systems. You can also try to encrypt all data in flight and in memory. This actually helps prevent physical attacks like the PCIe sniffing example. Again, if the data is encrypted in RAM, then whenever the CPU tries to store data there or read data from memory, it actually has to encode or decode the data. Pretty much all of the major cloud providers now offer memory encryption if you want it. It has a certain slowdown, which they don't tell you because they don't want you to be scared off by it. But I measured some realistic workloads on Google Cloud and there it was about a 15% slowdown. And that should be similar across everyone. It's hardware-based slowdown, not provider-based slowdown. Google is using AMD Epic chips for this implementation. But more on that in the next section. Part three, keeping AI data secure. When you're talking about securing AI workloads, there are a few differences from standard memory encryption. Mainly, of course, you have to somehow secure the GPU and the communication with the GPU, but we'll get there in a minute. Once you start to care more about security, you start to look for trusted execution environments or TEEs. These are mechanisms to make sure that whatever code is running inside that trusted environment can't be accessed by any other software on the device. The hardware provides that isolation between other types of software, even if the software is running at a higher privilege. Here's a quote. A TEE is a secure area within the main processor, isolated at the hardware level, where code can be executed and data processed in a fully secure manner. TEEs are highly technical, and I guess the first implementation of one was probably Intel SGX. That was about a decade ago, and these days Intel SGX is completely and utterly broken. There's a saying that it basically exists just to allow PhD students to publish easy new attack papers. And I think it's officially deprecated by Intel. There's another TEE for ARM processors called ARM Trust Zone, and this one worked out a lot better. It's what's used to secure biometric authentication on your smartphone, for example. If you're doing a fingerprint reader, the code that actually detects if your fingerprint is the one that the phone is expecting to see, well, that code runs inside a trusted execution environment. 
For a TEE, the processor has to provide a lot of special hardware features, like special memory page tables and extra permission checks and so on all with the goal of achieving three guarantees. Data confidentiality, no one can read the data. Data integrity, no one can modify the data. And code integrity, meaning no one can change the code so that it does something different. Generally speaking though, the threat model for TEEs is that there's a malicious attacker somewhere else on the same computer that's able to run software. Because for instance, TEEs often don't involve encrypting the memory in hardware. They just use CPU features to make sure other software can't read that. So if you're also thinking about hardware attackers, you have to go one step further. That's where confidential computing comes in. Here the attack model is that you're worried about someone with physical access to the machine who's doing hardware-based attacks as well as software-based attacks. And you want the same guarantees for the hardware attacks as you had for the software attacks. There are two technical requirements to make this work. You need to have memory encryption and hardware attestation, which you normally get by using a TEE. So you're basically taking the TEE and adding memory encryption to it. For the memory encryption, the hardware manufacturer embeds the key that's used for memory encryption into the CPU in such a way that it can't be read and every CPU has a unique key and only the code that's inside the trusted execution environment is allowed to fetch that key and use it for encryption and decryption. In terms of attestation, this basically means that you're making sure that the code that's running in the trusted execution environment is the code that's meant to be there. You normally have what's called a hardware chain of trust so that the hardware expects to only run code that is signed in a certain way. So it'll make sure to run a signed bootloader, which then makes sure to run a signed operating system, which then makes sure to run signed drivers, and so on and so forth. As long as the hardware chain of trust remains unbroken, you can be pretty sure that no attacker has maliciously changed one of the components underneath you. There are at least two implementations of confidential computing. There's Intel TDX, Intel Trust Domain Extensions, which is actually really new. And there's AMD SEV, which has been around for a bit longer. It seems to be the more popular technology, maybe just because it's been around longer, I don't know. And SEV has at least six different sub-technologies that can all be used independently or together according to whatever restrictions are in place. And each of these six mechanisms defends against a slightly different type of physical attacker-based attack. And they probably involve different performance hits and different levels of paranoia if you think your attacker can really do X, Y, Z. So it's a bit of a choose your own defense game. There are implementations for Intel SEV that are in the Linux kernel available as patches, but not all of them have been merged into mainline. In other words, not everyone has access to all of these patches, even if they wanted them. There is at least one other instance of confidential compute in data centers that you might run across, which is Apple. Apple actually implemented something for their own private cloud that ensures confidential computing. They actually have two separate CPUs on their boards where one of those CPUs does secure boot and is basically a secure coprocessor that allows the main CPU to run. Apparently it's very impressive infrastructure and it's mostly Apple trying to say, hey look, our iPhones are super secure. I don't know how many details are available about it publicly, but everyone I spoke to was really impressed by it. And now for the quote you've been waiting for, like I said, I met Jason Clinton, who is the CISO at Anthropic, meaning he's a C-level executive who's in charge of security. And this is what he had to say. Anthropic supports the ongoing efforts by our hardware and cloud computing partners to implement full confidential computing to help secure model weights during training and inference. So clearly Anthropic knows all about these details about what the cloud providers are trying to implement. And they're really concerned about a future where someone with physical access inside the data center actually steals their model weights. And yes, unfortunately, as you can imagine, it's difficult for Jason to speak publicly, to put things down in writing, so to speak. So that's the only quote that I was able to get from him. But returning to what I said at the beginning of this section, what about GPUs? Because AI companies don't just need confidential computing, they're also really worried about the GPUs. That's where the actual model weights are being stored. And GPU memory is just as sensitive to Rambo style attacks as any memory. So in other words, you want confidential computing for the GPU as well. You want GPU memory encryption and hardware attestation so that it doesn't run untrusted code. My impression is that the hardware attestation portion of this is pretty easy. Probably Nvidia already wants that for their own purposes. But encrypted memory is a bit harder. 
Nevertheless, it's actually possible on current generation NVIDIA GPUs like the H100. Basically, NVIDIA took those kernel patches for AMD SEV and even for Intel TDX, added some stuff of their own, and packaged it all together into a Linux that cloud providers or other people could just download and use. The instructions are super technical, but I linked them down below just in case you're curious. Basically, I guess, you can get the H100 to do arbitrary computations, and that includes encryption and decryption. But you're going to be spending a lot of time in those CUDA cores doing memory encryption and decryption. I don't know what the performance overhead is of having memory encryption on GPUs, but I gather it's pretty terrible. However, NVIDIA realized that this is such a huge problem and people really care about it. So Blackwell GPUs are going to support memory encryption at near native performance, or at least that's the plan. So confidential computing for GPUs is coming soon and data centers are expected to implement it as soon as possible. After all, Apple has shown that it can be done, that you can really have a focus on confidential computing and still deliver a good product. And I guess maybe that's making other providers feel left behind. That's the impression I got. Also, the big customers like Anthropic and OpenAI are going to demand it. So cloud providers like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google aren't really going to have any choice in the matter. As soon as the hardware supports it, they're going to be trying to download those patches, get it running on their physical machines so that they can provide GPU confidential computing the same way that they currently provide confidential computing of the CPU and its RAM. And needless to say, assuming the performance overhead really is close to zero, all training runs and model inference will start using this ASAP. After all, if you have a thousand computers in a data center that all have a copy of your model weights, you're basically asking for trouble at some point in the future if an adversary is bold enough to infiltrate that data center and start physically reading information from the memory. Finally, in conclusion, CPUs have started offering trusted execution environments, including on ARM processors in your smartphone, so that they can verify what code is being run and make sure no other software can actually read it. Recently, people have started to get even more concerned about hardware-based attackers, so to defend against that, you actually have to encrypt the memory. That comes at a performance cost, but nevertheless, cloud providers have actually been offering that mostly on AMD processors because some people with really confidential workloads are going to really want that, including, I'm just guessing here, but government contractors. If you start thinking about confidential computing in terms of GPUs, though, well, that's actually outside your security umbrella. The GPU cores and the GPU memory are not protected by a standard confidential computing. And although you can actually do attestation and even memory encryption on current GPUs, the performance is apparently terrible. So everyone is waiting for NVIDIA's Blackwell chips, which in theory have near zero overhead when they're doing memory encryption. So hopefully, full stack confidential computing is coming soon to a cloud near you. Don't forget to join our Discord. If you liked this video, check out this previous video in the series where I talk about the safety of AI model weights and whether AI labs will lose them to espionage. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.